things like that. But anyway, am I rambling? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, a lot of things you see on the internet now, I, I'll click on and, and I just I just ramble through it. And one thing I came across the other day was a guy who just got this Mora knife in the mail, and he sent out a video to everybody about the Mora knife. And was, this is my Mora knife. It's pretty cool. And see you later. <laughs> I don't understand that. <laughs> but, uh, the fact that he's talked about it more and I think comes directly from you being adopted by somebody else who made more famous. When I went to Sweden, I, as a joke, I just used myself as Mora. <laughs> 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 I, I couldn't correct him because they had said that. <laughs> I think the sufficient suspicion is that you adopted more and I in the program or is that you did because they were such a superior knife, but because in fact you were working with kids and you were cheap, yeah. accessible tool. I, I didn't know from beans what a good knife was. Well, first of, uh, well, of course, I, I went the route. Uh, the first knife that really caught my eye was called a boker. Mm -hmm. I mean, very expensive and so on. But I, you know, they're costly. So the next knife was uh, a knife uh, from Sheffield, England, the cheapest knife you could buy. And they, the pivot on which the blade swung was almost a piece of wire. We'd actually rebuild these knives. So for a number of years, we used that. And then came the open L, came into our attention. And then I found that the... Uh, the, 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 the the Mora knife uh, was very common, and that's the knife that actually I found that in, when I was young. My brother used it, and I even had my own, but you know, I sort of lost sight of that. And then I would buy Mora knives because they're relatively inexpensive, and they came razor sharp, so you could put off sharpening for a long time. <laughs> and people would say, how come you sell Moras, but you're using a boker? <laughs> I like both of them. Well, <laughs> people kept saying that until finally one day I said, I better use the, <laughs> the Mora knife because people keep asking me why I'm using a boker and I'm selling Moras. I discovered that that was the, you know, that goes back in the tradition of the northern peoples of, uh, of Europe. And you go back into the libraries and you'll find that style of knife depicted hundreds of years. Buck's knives only go back as far as Buck's brain came up with the concept of a buck knife. <laughs> or all of these others. When you see a surname to a knife, it doesn't usually impress much, as much as looking at a knife that the northern peoples said, this is the knife we want. This is what it looks like, basically. It's a utilitarian knife. It's sharp. It doesn't have many other things. And so I always find if the knife doesn't look like a Mora knife, it's likely not going to be working as well as a Mora knife. So I fixated it. And, and because of uh, the work I did, I went to thousands. I order the knives at a reduction to pass out of my student. Literally, they know, they know where I am in Sweden, or knew who I was, because my name seemed to be connected with thousands of knives passing out to the Canadian school programs when people learn, oh, you get a, people, a person come on a survival course and he's got a pretty expensive knife, and they say, what do you think of my knife? And I don't want to bad mouth someone who's gone to a lot of expense. And I'll say, well, you know, of course, you get a chance to sort of compare. But uh, if things don't work out, then that individual buys five more knives <laughs> and the course is over because finally they got a knife that really is meant to be used as a bush knife. Uh, anyway. Why do you wait around your neck? Well, actually, probably, uh, let's take a frivolous route here. <laughs> Anybody who wears a knife around the neck has got something to do with me. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe not. But uh, the, the situation was that I, I worked uh, uh, early in my career. There was a, an event where a nurse crashed, and she was the fourth or fifth nurse in the National Health and, Sur uh, uh, Health and, Wealth and uh, Welfare and Service, uh, the, the national one, which service all the northern communities and native reserves. There's over four, five thousand people at that time. She was the fifth to die in a crash, and they all decided to uh, um, have this four-night survival course. And they dictate they must fall a tree, they must be this, which was uh, terrible. But anyway, all these nurses, more often than not, if they brought scissors and knife, they're wearing them on the neck. And and generally, you know, in, in sort of discussing it, well, native people often don't have belts, and native people. Uh, you know, don't have a place to put their knives, so they just, with a string, wear around their neck. And the nurses uh, didn't say, well, you never lose your knife this way or other. It was just very handy. 
So I started using it that way, but it was based on getting this insight from the native people. And I realized that, well, one time I did a series of films, and the producers there said, as they watched all I was doing, and I don't do that, I put it in my knife. And you know, you must have saved about an hour today because your <laughs> knife was here. <laughs> and you did stuff and you put it there. It wasn't like, you know, crazy. And here you, you lose your knife more readily. And here, students come and they fish your knife out of your sheath if you're not careful. They do that a lot, high school students. So they can't fish it out. <laughs> and you have to understand. <laughs> when you make this suggestion, you got to keep in fact that when the fairer sex wear the knife, that you got to have the right sort of thing so it's not too titillating. Swing the knife. <laughs> 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 and it was based on the natives' habit, and I thought hey, there are a lot of things that the native people would do that once you examine them, you find well, probably you know it's uh, it's. Uh, it's probably better to imitate them than to ignore them because very often they really knew what they were doing and you might not know what they're doing because you're guessing and, and just do what they do and it often works out better. Uh, the native people, at least for the last 17 years, had a lot of money to spend. Uh, it's called the Native Cultural Fund. And uh, the Native Cultural Fund was supposed to uh, help us understand help us and the native people understand their culture better. They themselves cannot produce the type of instructor that they need to. They are starting because they're getting educated. And so <laughs> I am a Polish Canadian teaching native people their own <laughs> skills because a generation skipped. Old, old native people really know their stuff. Their children went for the modern stuff and said, ah, my father doesn't know that much, I would rather. And, and, and the statement, you actually can say that, that the kids, taking out their uh, native kids, they often say they rediscover their grandparents. Because the outdoor educators would say, can you ask your grandfather what they did about this and that? And the grandparents all came from that era. But they, there was a skipped generation. And there are many situations that take too long to tell where they're uh, involved. But one thing that always amused me was, Every few years there was a, a committee of native people with long braids looking at where this money went. And the lady, the native lady who was my coordinator, she, had a, she simplified the problem. She said, can you build me as many artifacts, birch bark, this and that, and put them in this display cabinet. So when this committee comes, they say, who is this Kowalski? Is that an Indian name? <laughs> we just spent $20,000 on this guy. <laughs> you know, what, 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 where, where is that? And she says, well, come with me. And she points to that in the bookcase. And they look and they nod and say, oh, fine. We now know. We understand. Good. It's not wasted. <laughs> that was well, this old native woman, she's about 80 years old. Her great, her grandson is a problem because she, you know, her, her daughter died. So she took up to raising him. He started having a, a few problems and being a delinquent a little bit. But I discovered she was an ancient fund of knowledge. And... Tom Roycroft had a habit. He says, you know, when you start to think of things, what is at the top of the list always? What is, you know, plants and everything. And I asked her in this question, I said, of all the things known in the forest, what is, would be placed at the very top of the list? And she sort of said, eh, I'm going to need time to think about this because no one has ever asked that question. I'm going to over it. So the next time, a few weeks later, she gives me this fungus. And there's 15 pages about this fungus. And but subsequently, from what she told me, other native people say, who think you're not supposed to know that? You're not a native person. That's not your prerogative to have this knowledge. But uh, she, she passed it on to me. Well, oh, marvelous. Uh, one of the most powerful cures for PMS you could ever find. <laughs> What's the difference between a woman with PMS and a pit bull? Lipstick. Well, <laughs> a lot of people. well, this fungus uh, uh, you know, is, is astounding in its applications, and and that that began to you know put me in good stead. Well, she was a pundit. You know, I could almost have written a book about her and, and the knowledge, this old ancient knowledge that she had. That basically was uh, going uh, well. Stuart, I think he's embroiled in a lot of this stuff, Stuart Goring and that. He works with the Panana. Now he's relating to the 70-year-olds, 80-year-olds. Those guys' children, 
they're off somewhere else. And the seven year olds are almost starved to tell about their days and what they did and on and on. And when they meet an individual that shows uh, any interest in it, they'll go over backwards to, to, to you know, uh, help out and, 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 uh, and show things and the way things were. So there's still a few people that, that know the old ways, but uh, once that goes, well, we just got to reinvent a lot of things. Okay. Um, I built hundreds and hundreds of solar stills. I was on the internet the other day and I saw a guy teaching how to build solar stills out of black plastic, which I thought, have I been wrong all these years? And then uh, couldn't figure out what that was all about. And then uh, teaching, teaching people how to make things, uh, knives or projects of any kind, they, they want museum quality. Well, we were, we were doing a brain tank class once and one was halfway through scraping her hides and said, is this going to be museum quality hide when I'm done? And the teacher said, well, no, this is your first hide. She dropped the tools and walked away. So, uh, people want quality without <coughs> adjustment. And you go to something that's called the three times ten. You explain what that is and why you do it. And the three times ten. Do you remember that? Well, what do you mean? Have I spent an hour teaching you? You've got to spend hours trying to perfect that skill? Three times three times Oh, 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 yeah. Well, oh, yeah. Oh yeah, there is this. My career centered around the third and fourth year university students for 22 years. Give them a shovel, you try to dig a hole, they break the handle in the next five minutes. <laughs> you have to teach a, a university student, you cannot pound an, a plastic tent peg through an Alberta rock. <laughs> you gotta go it because they will continue pounding until they shatter and then we don't have tent pegs. Um, you know, the, there's a hole that you, you, you see a lot. It, if you, you can meet a girl who's maybe fourth year university and she has never struck a match before in her life. And it's, un you think, well, it's just simple, take a few minutes. No, it turns out to be, uh, you, you have to like one of those fungi because you're getting a, a tiger on there. They're getting mad and they're getting furious. And the more they cry, they just can't. And, they're, and you think, what, what, you know, what's so simple? But you're saying, and the more you try to help, the more furious they get. And they're their own worst enemy. It doesn't happen very often, but it happens often enough. They're a predictable sort of thing. And, and there are sort of things there. Well, when you're in this process, we find that a lot of people will take a course from you, sign up for the next course, and don't do a single thing on the, how the heck can I give you more advanced stuff if you don't? So for every hour you spend with me, if you don't spend 10 hours, you're not gonna get anywhere on the second course. Because the door is open as your knowledge opens. The, the, uh, uh, there's a sequential type of thing and you gotta, whether you like it or not, you have to sort of uh, pay attention to these things when you're working with people. When you're learning something, you've got to try to be sure of your source. You've got to know what you're doing. How do you get to that? You've got to deal with knowledgeable people. you got to, you got to uh, use good books. And once you know what you're doing, the next thing is you've got to get good at it. Getting good, you know, it's learning how to swim. Do you think anything that we do is any different than learning how to swim or driving a car? Can you learn how to swim? from a manual, without a swimming instructor there. And where is it that you begun to swim? It's a while, splashing around, doing everything that you, you can't shortchange it. Some people are more gifted than others. And that analogy carries further, uh, in that some people walk off the dock, they fall, they got a yard to reach the piling and they drown because they can't. Then there's the person that swims across the channel there back and forth again, three times nonstop. They wore a life jacket, they couldn't achieve that. If the law says you must wear a life jacket or whatever, then people say, well, you wore a life jacket. Anyone can do it if they wear a life jacket. No, that's that sort of thing. So you, you gotta uh, judge yourself where you are in that spectrum and then you start from there. Well, now once you, you practice your skills to get good, someone has to tell you what that means. And once you get good, You've got to become fast. And once you become fast, without compromise of safety, the quality of effort, if it means anything, you must be able to do it in the darkness with your eyes closed. And in the end, you also have to be so knowledgeable because the hardest thing to ever achieve is know when to cut your losses and quit. It's the greatest amount of wisdom to say, ah, I'm going to quit because if I continue, I die. That sort of thing. Where did I learn that? I learned that from native people. <laughs> I'm listening to a program years down the line, 
and they're interviewing an old native, a, a young native girl, and then her mother. The young native girl got adopted by a white family. Subsequently, she got a job working for a native office of some sort, and then she became curious about her background and eventually found her mother. When they interviewed the mother, they said, well, this is the circumstance around which I gave up my grandchildren because I just couldn't cope, etc., etc. And then they talked about her, her lifestyle. She said, you know, as, as women, we had to know certain things because that was important. She says, that wasn't good enough. We had to be good at it. She says, that wasn't good enough. We had to be fast. And I thought, hey, that's, that's, uh, that's important <laughs> in survival and that. I didn't come up with it. I happened to accidentally run across it. And it became my pattern sort of thing in the, in the issue of that there's nothing like, well, what is it? Stuart was telling me that the military, if they want you to be an automatic reaction to things, so you're you're uh, you're uh, uh, trying to uh, secure a building, and you walk into the building, and all of a sudden you see somebody, you got to make a very split decision whether you're going to shoot that person or not. <laughs> you got to be taught that you shouldn't shoot a person necessarily, but it takes about seven thousand repetitions to achieve this very exquisite way to make a decision sort of thing. We're very we're very superficial in a lot of things. I don't know where we're going. What's the next question? <laughs> question, anybody got a question? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> West of Lake Winnipeg is Haploporus odoratus. No. East of Winnipeg is Tramedi Savio Lens. If you are walking along the street and you've got a fungus like this in front of you. And a native guy, he's got 24, 24, 24, 24. He's walking along the street. He sees this fungus and he starts to try to negotiate to trade all the beer he has with him for that fungus because he's going to get a far superior <laughs> the use of that fungus than drinking all that beer. <laughs> you may have the most roaring headache you could ever imagine, the most overpowering uh, migraine. You like that fungus? You could have a headache that's induced by snow blindness, as in my case, and you light it and you breathe it for a few minutes, and in about 10 minutes, it is all gone. You can, well, I actually saw it where I go to visit a, a friend and his wife is ballistic about something, <laughs> but she has to be civil because I uh, make coffee, but she was kind of mad, and I thought, well, I got a piece of fungus, so I light it, and, and she said, what is that? And I said, well, it's a fungus. And she picks it up and she says, oh, that's quite exquisite, she said. And as she sat there, before our eyes, she just mellowed out. <laughs> she was mad at her. Went away. <laughs> now, one woman in a hundred will smell that fungus and take a stick and try to beat it out and try to get a pail of water and throw it and try to put it out because to them it's just unbearable. That but anyway. And to the native people, it's uh, it's in their ceremonial and their religion. It uh, represents the north and wisdom. Like you know, sweet grass represents something another, and juniper something another. I'm kind of think of that, but I know that much. And with native people, if I bring a chunk of that fungus, it's like a ticket to let me into whatever. They uh, they they are so enamored and, and it's so precious to them that if you happen to know where to find it, you. You can, Native people will cooperate with you and so on. Because the, the, uh, the common thing you see when people get into light a bit of it and they just sit there and breathe that smoke in. You can make it go further, become a and so on. And I don't think it's addictive, but. Uh, it's, 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 uh, uh, by popular to me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's a call. I tried to talk to, talk to George. Talk to George back there. I tried to bring. I, I'm not trying. I brought some across the border on the way to one of the rabbit sticks, and they questioned me very severely as to what this was and what it was used for. And I lied. I, um, I happen to have a white uh, deer hide that hadn't been canned, so still, you look for the dead thing. <laughs> Where is it? Because I smell something very dead. I still smell it, and I said, that's how we sort of control the stench, and they accepted it at the border. <laughs> they held it up to this dog, and the dog went, and went away and did something else. So they figured, <laughs> so, uh, I heard that there was nothing in there that dogs considered to be unacceptable, but 
it, it is on the top. There is the next is rat poop. It is at the very top of all the unique things that this thing does. It is, uh, and it, it only grows on diamond willow. And uh, the fungus. Now the fungus is alive. And yeah, like I accidentally one time I har harvested, and when you can squeeze the juice, that juice that you squeeze, you squeeze it into an earache, and it helps reduce the pain and the earache. But it, when it's squeezable like that, it's very heavy. So when you're harvesting it, you gotta work harder. But I filled this bag and I put it away and forgot it. And sometime later, what is this? Oh, it's that fungus. And I look in there and it's all bright green. Oh, what a waste. What a waste. But I didn't throw it away. And I, and I still had, I, I tried to retrieve it by drying the stuff out. And, uh, put it out. It didn't really want to dry, but I mentioned this native guy, how I really went to a lot of trouble. What? He said, it turned green. He says, well, it's probably five times more powerful than normal when it turns green. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so a lot of us have you to blame for being here this week, and if they don't have you to blame already, they'll have you to blame by the end of the week. Um, where do you see what's going on here at uh, well, number one, I think, from my perspective, uh, I am really big on what I call, I personally call tangible education. Uh, we don't uh, teach enough to our kids in elementary school and all the school system about nature. We've lost that to a certain extent. I hope that some of this will, the, the, the wild plants and, the, and all these things, uh, the human mind, when they try to depict how much of the brain is assigned to various parts of the body, this plum nucleus or whatever, how you pronounce that, enormous hands, very big lips, fairly big teeth. We have to use our hands a lot more because, oh, years ago, I remember people saying, how come the best surgeons in New York are usually farm boys that went to university and became surgeons? Why? It was almost invariably the best surgeons known but were brought up on the farm because they had the development of the brain and the hands and that allowed them to make that we are the beings that have to make our electronics and our bowstrings and everything and access and everything with our hands it's got to go through the eye through the brain and the hands and the kids they get a lot of tv and so when a fourth year university student can't strike a match or dig a hole, those are kind of inconsequential, but there's a gazillion other things they can't do because they never had the opportunity to do them. And we start, should start insisting that we do a lot of this sort of thing to, to stimulate the brain, if nothing else. Uh, I don't know a lot more about nature, not about stars, not about animals, not about how our ancestors lived. <coughs> Uh, and I always tell people all this stuff, if nothing else, it's a marvelous hobby. <laughs> and, and that marvelous hobby can probably very often, no, you, today you can get an ice storm. And the ice storm shuts down and the towers fall down and maybe weeks and months before the electricity is back. This smart thinking person has got a wood stove somewhere. Don't put it up in your house in a bedroom because the municipality doesn't like that. The people figure you'll set the house on fire, which you might do, and then it's gonna burn the block down with that. No, put that shelter tent, whatever, in the corner of the lot, and uh, use that, and, and compact that. Make your camping skills that much more uh, refined and so on. And if you burn the tent down, you likely, <coughs> no one minds that so much. <laughs> and the municipality will encourage you to use that, or the. The, the county or whoever will encourage you to go that route. And I want, you know, there's no, uh, no, uh, 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 you know, I, I you did these walks and we would have these survival instructor trainees. You have a dozen students. They work with you over a period of two years. I hate setting exams. I'm not a certifying agency. So for these people to pass in their own mind, they have to go on a hundred mile walk, 10 days, and you're not camping. You're supposed to put your head in the bosom of Mother Nature and accept the fact that you're going to have to try to get by without sleeping bags and tent, overdress a bit, carry a pot, make sure you got a first aid kit for safety, and go to safety in numbers. 
the backpackers are blown away because they're carrying minimal gear. They, there's the certain things you have to know what to do, but they're not carrying 75 pounds on their back. At the end of the, the, the day, they're far more rested. And the, the pride they feel in the fact that they didn't have to use too much uh, uh, man-made gimmicks to get by made them realize that nature can provide if you know how to extract it, if you know what I mean. And personally, I would go, because I said I've got to professionally really do a lot of this because if I talk a lot about it and I don't do it, my credibility sort of goes. But the highest high that you can probably achieve uh, as a normal person is to use that approach at the nice time of the year. You go and you don't need anything more than a Dow jacket, no sleeping bag, and you're not going to go hungry because the raspberries are so dense. And that raspberry therapy will probably set your reset your health clock for a year. Because those seeds from those raspberries are going to tickle your guts and your thing. And, and then the neat thing about that is you don't have to pretend to go, because you can go anywhere and everybody thinks it's a bear. <laughs> so you don't have to embroil in all these other sort of things because no one can tell the difference between that and a bear that's eaten an awful lot of raspberries. <laughs> and, and that sort of realization, it's hard to achieve any other way. But, but the objective of our kids should be that at a certain point they know their competency and everything. This is not to fight any war or to, you know be a better hobo or whatever. It's the great satisfaction that you get and the great amount of opportunity to use those hands to develop your brain that much more. I met a girl once who was probably the crack shot in North America in drawing six guns and firing at balloons with these special views. And I watched her for a while. I was at a trade show. And I knew